All of the measures of risk and return that we've looked at thus far relate to what we call a one period model. That is, we examine the performance of a portfolio over a single period where we know in advance what that one period might be. In this learning objective, we examine risk and return over long investment periods where we look at a multi-period model. So when we're looking at risk and return over multiple periods, a really good starting point is to consider a quote by Harry Markowitz back in 1996, where he said that investing for the long run in the stock market is like playing crap shoot in Las Vegas, except in Las Vegas the odds are with the house. As for the market, the odds are with you because on average over the long run, the market has paid off. So what does this mean? Well, let's imagine that we're playing a coin toss game. And let's imagine with respect to this coin toss game, it pay, costs you nothing to play, but if the coin lands on heads, you win $100, and if it lands on tails, you lose $100. Now, in this case, the expected value of the coin toss game is zero. Now, you can, if you play the coin toss game once, we know that there's going to be significant variation in the possible return because you'll either end up $100 in front or $100 behind, and the actual return outcome can be one of those two values. But as you play the coin toss more and more, what we should find is that the law of large numbers suggests that your actual return becomes closer and closer to that expected return, such that the volatility of returns will decrease, and yeah, you're likely to see a return close to zero if you play many, many times over. So that one example goes to show how the volatility of a particular outcome can vary from a one period or one off investment through to multi periods. So, what's Mark Witt saying in this particular quote comparing stock markets to crapshoot? Well, if we think about uh, games in Vegas, for example, when we gamble in Las Vegas, we know that, as suggested by Mark Witt, the odds are with the house. That is, if you played the coin toss game I just mentioned, then if it lands heads, you would win $100, but if it lands on tails, you would lose $110. In that example, you've actually got a negative expected return, which is what happens when you play any of these uh, gambling games uh, in Las Vegas. So with respect to uh, my coin toss game where the odds are with the house, if we flip the coin many, many times, uh, we would see that you, you would have a negative expected return across time, so it would be highly probable that you would lose money because you play many, many times over. The variance of returns gets quite small because the uh, actual return should converge to the expected return value due to the law of large numbers, and it becomes a very high probability that you'll lose money. The stock market, on the other hand, we know from long-term historical evidence, has a positive expected return. That is, if we're playing the coin toss game in a stock market, it's like playing a game where you flip a coin, if it lands heads, you win $110, and if it lands tails, you lose $100. Once again, in a one-off game, you can have a significant win or a significant loss. Just like if you invest for one period in the stock market, a really large loss is what, yeah, highly possible. However, if we play this coin toss game over and over again where it's got a positive expected return, the law of large numbers again suggests that the actual return should converge with expected return, and after playing the game many, many times, there would be a very high probability that you would come out in front, that you would earn uh, a positive return in total. So this analogy is what Harry Markowitz is saying, is that even though in terms of one period equity markets look quite risky, the positive expected returns and the fact that equities tend to earn a higher return than almost any other asset class suggest that if you're investing for the long run, if you're investing across multiple periods, then the risk of actually underperforming becomes quite low because over multiple periods, the difference between actual returns and expected returns becomes quite small. Let's have a look at this in terms of actual data. If I think about um, investing in the Australian Securities Exchange Index from 1970 to 2015, and what I've looked at here is rolling holding periods of one year, five years, 10 years, through to 25 years. So I've got for each of these particular periods, both the best and worst return per annum across this time horizon. So if we invest just for one year at a time, so if we just hold our equity investment for one year, then in 58% of years, we get a positive return. But that means we're actually losing in 42% of the time. However, if we have a five-year horizon, we can actually see that the worst possible return is reducing quite substantially, and the percentage of five-year periods that are positive is 88%. 
Across the period 1970 to 2015, any holding period of 10 years or more had a 100% strike rate of earning positive returns. And what we can see is that as we get to a very long time period of 25 years, we're getting our mean returns really converging to our, our long run expected return values. So this is the idea that if you use multiple investment periods, if you look at the long run horizon of investing, the probability of underperforming or the probability of losing money is actually very small, despite the fact that the objective probability of losing money in a single period can be quite high. Think of this another way. Let's think of it mathematically. Let's imagine that you're saving $1 towards retirement in 25 years' time or 300 months' time. And let's say, again, you're going to invest this money in a portfolio that has a positive expected return of 1% per month. Hence, we can do our expected return calculations and we said if we invested that $1 with an expected return of 1% per month compounding across 300 months, our expected terminal value is $19.79. Suppose that alternatively we could invest this in a risk-free government bond that earns uh, an annual uh, effective risk-free rate of 6% or 0.4867% per month compounding. In that particular case, we would find that our risk-free government bond uh, would have a terminal value of $4.29. So we can invest in a risky asset with an expected return of $19.79 or a risk-free asset of $4.29. Okay? People might say, well, the problem with this risky asset is the variability of returns. So the monthly premium that we're seeing here is risk-free. We can earn 0.486755% per month compounding monthly versus 1% per month um, with a risky asset. So the question is, well, what's the difference in risk across these two assets? Well, let's say that that 1% expected return per month came about because you effectively had a coin toss each month, whereby there's a 50% probability of earning a 5.54% positive return or a 55% a 50 chance of a 3.54% negative return. Okay, we do expected return calculation we can see where that 1% per month positive expected return comes from. You can see that down here. So we can calculate the standard deviation of this particular portfolio, being the probability times the difference between the uh, observed and uh, mean return squared. So squared deviations from the mean times the probability plus squared deviations from the mean times probability gives us that the standard deviation of this risky investment that we saw before was 6.42%. So, what we can say is that there are a range of possible outcomes that, uh, that can be achieved, and we can think of those in terms of a binomial tree. Okay, with, with regard to our binomial tree, we start with a dollar, a okay, 50% chance of each possible outcome here. Um, so there's a 50% chance of being worth a dollar and five cents after one month, and a 50% chance of being worth 96 cents. At each node, again, we've got a 50% chance of each outcome, and we finish with these four possible terminal outcomes. So across two periods, we've got a 25% chance that our dollar's worth $1.11. We've got two times this probability, so we've got a 50% chance that our $1 is going to $1.1.8. And we've got a 25% chance that our $1 has reduced in value down to $0.93. Cents. So across two periods, there's still quite a big risk. We've got 25% chance here that we're losing quite a lot of, a lot of money. 50% chance of a very small return and 25% chance of a pretty big positive return. So across just two periods, there's, there's still quite a large uh, risk associated with the potential loss of this investment. And what happens is we continue to extend out this binomial tree and we look at long, the long time period of 300 months. Well, we already looked before at the expected return of investing across that period of time. But what we can also say is if we extend this, oops, this tree from before continually for 300 months, okay, the best possible outcome is that we're flipping a coin, heads we win, tails we lose. The best possible outcome is winning 300 times in a row. Now, the probability of that is 0.5 to the power of 300, very low. But if that did eventuate, then the return we would get would be that upside return plus 1 to the power of 300, our $1 in the best case scenario would turn to $10,595.634. Equally, we could have the worst possible outcome, tails we lose 300 times over. In that case, 
uh, the return each period is 0.9646, so our initial investment compounded 300 times. In that particular case, our dollar would be effectively worthless. It would be worth 0 0.00002. Now, what we can do is we can simply calculate the probabilities and the dollar terminal values for each outcome. Just think about extending this binomial tree out uh, 300 periods, so the tree gets bigger every time, and we end up with a probability that looks like the following. Okay, where we've got uh, basically a cluster around here, around the, the expected return value. But we can work out that, uh, we can calculate the probability of earning a return that is less than $1, or a negative return. Uh, we can calculate that particular probability as being equal to 0.0205%. Okay, so 0.02%. Such a trivial pop probability that can almost be considered zero. So we had an investment that was hugely risky in terms of the potential downside over one period, but when we extend that over multiple periods, the chance of it losing money was nearly zero. So that's the effect that we see when we have a particular asset whereby the expected returns are positive, and that's why Harry Markowitz back in 1996 was telling us that whenever we have some asset with a positive expected return, if we invest for the long run across multiple periods, then the probability of underperforming is actually quite low.